Um, my goodness, uh, I can't believe how full the room is and how full the room is online as well. I think that's a really fantastic compliment to the speaker I'm going to introduce you in a moment. Um, most of you in the room know me, I think. I'm Vicky Nash. I'm director of the OAI. I'm really delighted to host you for this talk this afternoon. Um, we have got, it feels actually like sort of a whole day of uh, activities today focused around the potential contributions of AI for government, for policy making, for innovation and public well-being, um, both of which uh, one this afternoon was, was organised by Keegan, obviously one now being delivered by him. Um, but I just wanted to flag at the beginning, I think, how important it is that OII is researching this area, that we're expanding our capacity and that we're able to teach many of you great students who are in the room on these topics which matter and I hope you'll go into jobs where you can make a difference on this sort of topic after. Um, it's really great having Keegan speak this afternoon because he is one of those rare creatures who has crossed over uh, academic and sort of, you know, government divides. So I don't know if you know, but um, if I understand right, your, your own PhD was in um, public administration and technology. So again, that's quite a rare thing. Uh, you've got a postdoc at Tallinn University in Estonia. And note the Estonia link there, it's going to be important. I hope we'll refer to that perhaps in what comes. Um, but um, uh, in, sorry, that's where you did your PhD. You had a postdoc at the Hertie School, I should say, yeah. in Berlin. Um, but equally, you were the technical lead, weren't you, for the Open Data Gov portal, I think, in Estonia, is that right? Yeah. So so yes, exactly. Most of us as academics, we write about things that other people do and, and suggest that we know all about it. Keegan has been on both sides and therefore has, I think, a really sort of unique form of expertise, which we can talk about this afternoon. So um, Keegan, our Departmental Research Lecturer in AI Government Policy, thank you very much for doing this afternoon. Thank yeah, you. thanks for having me. So some of you are here for the talk um, this afternoon where we talked a little bit about the geopolitics of AI and some of the implications that we might see um, coming because of that. Uh, if you were there, this is gonna be a little bit different. I certainly have a different opinion on a lot of things. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So anyway, what I wanna talk about today is looking past the hype, the real implications of artificial intelligence for the public sector. So nice memes to keep us all entertained as we go through this, you know, statistics, but you put a nice frame on it, then comes machine learning. And when you get the audience, it's artificial intelligence. Um, so a few points I wanna talk about today. First. Bureaucracy is not going to disappear anytime soon. Government's not going to go away. Uh, second, governments have always wanted to collect data. They've been doing this for hundreds of years, and they've been trying to apply it in more increasingly strategic ways. Uh, third, governments probably will be able to use AI to offer new services, uh, but at the moment, they're not really ready to do that yet. Fourth, if they want to do this, it requires data. AI you know, uses data to train itself, which means that the government has to collect a lot of information about you, not just about you, but about where you live and about the houses in your country and about how you behave and so on and so forth. So driven by processes of rationalization, AI will make governments more effective and efficient, particularly at control and surveillance, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It could, for example, improve service delivery. There could be this movement towards proactive service delivery. They could be better at welfare. Mm -hmm. Um, but we should still probably talk about this. So how I'm going to go through these points, uh, really quickly, history lesson, because it matters, uh, really brief overview about what AI is, how it works, talking a little bit about the current discourses on AI and government, and then a little bit on the future and sort of what I expect uh, to happen over the coming, apparently, weeks, if we keep up the current pace, but more likely months and years. So just as a starting point, this comes from Higgs in 2001 about the history of the surveillance state in modern England going back over a couple hundred years. And they write, if one were to ask to create a list of the features of the modern Western state, which sets it apart from previous political formations, the central collection and analysis of information, especially that on individuals, would be a strong contender for inclusion. Similarly, Dover 2021, early modern states and the bureaucracies uh, relied on documents to represent virtually the lands and populations over which they had authority. The state in early modern Europe became an information manager. So information has always been an important part of this equation. So that's why we're starting with the state. I mean, this still matters, right? And the state essentially, I mean, drawing from Weber, but this is Michael Mann's sort of seminal work in 1984 on it, uh, defines the state as a differentiated set of institutions and personal embodying. Uh, centrality in the sense that political relations radiate outwards from the center, uh, you know, territory, and, you know, Weber famous for this one, a monopoly on the use of violence, basically. So you have the state, you need to run it. How do you run it? Bureaucracy. This is what Weber is quite famous for. 
Uh, to Weber, bureaucracy was something unavoidable. This is how you manage the state. It was a sort of, if you were going to modernize, if you were going to develop, bureaucracy was the way to do this most efficiently and effectively. He doesn't necessarily like that idea, but this is just how he saw the world. And, you know, he says something along the lines of the power of all officials rests on knowledge and that bureaucratic administration means fundamentally domination through knowledge. So even here, right, the creation, storage, management of information are key for the bureaucracy to work and for the state to run. Third point, once again, you know, this is not new. I just want to drill this point home. Like for hundreds of years, states have been collecting information and developing tools to use this information so they could run the state more efficiently and effectively. Now, when we get more into AI, you'll see that there's a lot of overlaps. I mean, especially this example of ChatGPT or LLMs. What is it really good at? Taking tons and tons of information and giving me a paragraph that I can read and understand. In many ways, it's just a really efficient information management system. So the general, you know, how I'm sort of thinking about it, you have nation states, they begin to cement themselves as the status quo, you need to run them. Bureaucracy, as described by Weber, is probably the most efficient way to do this. Uh, but guess what? You want to make it better. So you start collecting data, you start improving the bureaucracy. This is why Prussia was quite the military power. They were able to move troops around very quickly, and this was powered in part by the effectiveness of their bureaucracy. But this requires data, which also leads to more surveillance control, whether that's bad, whether it's good, depends on who you ask. Uh, but you need to manage it somehow. And when you're developing new systems to manage it, can you create more technology, which then needs to be managed? And it's sort of this control begets control, technology begets technology uh, cycle. So that's the, the foundation of sort of how I'm thinking about this. State's important, bureaucracy is important, not going away. We need to understand the context. So yeah, once again, this is just hinting at how ridiculous it is to talk about AI because the mark has been moving every year for the past, I don't know, 30, 40 years. Um, if you were to show AI to people who were working on some of the initial stuff, I don't know, in the 70s, 80s, uh, this would be insane. Whereas something that was popular five years ago, they'll just tell you statistics from machine learning. Um, so it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a very quickly moving mark. Um, and yeah, when you're fundraising, it's AI. When you're hiring, it's ML. And when you're implementing, it, it's uh, just a progression. So... As I was saying, people don't really know what AI is. I mean, we know if we see it, so to say, but there's something like 28, 30 different definitions that can be tossed around. Um, the OECD in 2019 is, is probably one of the more commonly cited ones. And they basically say that AI is a machine-based system that can, for a given set of human-defined objectives, make predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing real or virtual environments. AI systems are designed to operate with varying levels of autonomy, and they additionally add that AI are machines performing human-like cognitive functions. Uh, the EU AI has another different uh, definition. Uh, different standard agencies like NIST have their own definitions. You will find definitions. Uh, the UK doesn't use any of these. They have like a two-part sort of approach to defining AI. So really, who you ask, you're going to get a different definition. It doesn't really matter. But when we are talking about AI, realistically, we're talking about machine learning still today. I mean, of course, we can get into the semantics of it, but for all intents and purposes, what we're talking about is machine learning in most cases. Um, and this is different than, for example, symbolic approaches or rules-based approaches. There are many different camps to AI. You have you know, narrow in general. Today, we're talking about machine learning applied to sort of specific use cases. And it's basically an approach where machines learn to make predictions in new, station, uh, in new situations based on historical data. So I don't really want to go into the, the sort of two depth of a background. But at a minimum, statistical model, data, and the infrastructure to run it, this is sort of what's required. Of course, you know, you can do some things with the coding and with the algorithms, and uh, there's, there's a little bit more to it than that, but at a bare bones level, that's what you need. Okay, so, you know, we've all read the news. We all understand that AI is becoming increasingly important. Apparently, it's going to bring about the end of the world, um, but also it's going to sort of modernize everything or this is what you hear, uh, or you know, people sort of push back and say, maybe we just get rid of all technology and you know, technology is bad. But regardless of your opinion, what is clear, there is a huge interest in this topic. So this is taken from my friend's PhD thesis, Colin Van Noort, who's done a ton of research on AI in the public sector, and especially for the EU. 
um, you see a monumental increase in the number of pub publications that are dealing with AI and the public sector starting in roughly 2017, 2018, uh, which is conveniently right around the time we were writing this working paper for the OECD on uh, well AI in the public sector. It's uh, admittedly a little bit biased, but I think it's a good read, uh, like 200 pages or something like that covers the fundamentals of everything from like the infrastructure to uh, machine learning to different types of machine learning to the fundamentals, how it works to future use cases to how do you do this stuff ethically and, and so on and so forth. So this is what we were hearing today a little bit. And it's one narrative that you hear quite a lot. So this is from Pazaitis and Drexler who don't subscribe to this belief, but they're sort of criticizing it. But I think they, they summarize this argument super well that technology in the state are deemed statutorily antagonistic and technological progress is often assumed to advance towards a condition that would simply, sorry, it's a typo, uh, engineer the state away. There is often the idea that the state conflated with the nation state would simply wither away via new forms of technologically enabled sovereignty. You hear this a lot. Why do we need a state? We have technology, just trust your engineers, bro. <laughs> this is a really popular one. We heard it today, we hear it in many other places. Whether that's good or bad depends who you ask. On the other side, you get these, you know, the states create the markets, they provide national defense, and they're still able in principle to determine the most fundamental aspects of people's life chances, the question of life and death. They still have the monopoly on the, you know, use of violence. Or, or Duguay is cited by Bukhart in this recent work on the neo-Bavarian state. Bureaucracy has proven remarkably resilient. Bureaucratic forms of organization have played and continue to play a vital and productive role in ordering existence in a number of domains, public and private, governmental and voluntary. The technological process progress hasn't started with AI, right? Like we've been doing technological innovation for hundreds of years and the state's still here, bureaucracy's still here. If this was supposed to replace the state, shouldn't that have happened already? And then you get into the AI discourse, which is like, you know, can AI be a fair judge in court? Estonia thinks so. I don't think we've actually piloted that yet, but people were at least talking about it at one point. You know, why AI and the public sector are a winning formula. AI and government drives extraordinary possibilities. Artificial intelligence and the end of government. How AI could transform government. More than half of Europeans want to replace lawmakers with AI, study says. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. And look at all this stuff we can do. We can have chatbots and natural language processing, automation, automated decision making, healthcare, safety, public services. I mean, this was a a robot in Sweden that was supposed to remove human bias from the interviewing process. This is a, a chatbot called Bureaucrat in, in Estonia. The idea being they want to move towards this like AI-based sort of personal assistant to help deliver public services. Uh, COVID-19, a lot of stuff came out where you're using computer vision to, I don't know, see if people were standing too close to each other or not and like find sort of hot spots and things like that. Okay, yeah, probably we can do some stuff, but actually, um, this is what most governments look like, right? New Jersey needs volunteers who know COBOL, a 60-year-old programming language. I remember being in the States and being on the, seeing the national news like, hey, we need help because uh, nobody knows how to fix this. <laughs> you know, the UK exam debacle reminding us that algorithms can't fix broken systems. Data Protection Authority overturns controversial algorithm. Sharp IT budget. Oh, by the way, everybody's getting older. So we're supposed to do all this cool, innovative AI stuff like, ooh, nice, but you don't have money, you don't have a workforce, uh, and you're running 60-year-old technology. Take the example of Germany, where they're still using fax machines, everything's on paper, <laughs> and then you have to explain to the CTO, you know, why you can't implement a machine learning model that's relying on a fax machine. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the infrastructure, the processes, this stuff is all important. So this is the actual situation, right? <laughs> Not enough money. funding. Well, first of all, people don't understand what AI is and isn't. And, and oftentimes, like, you know, if it's just a chatbot, you might find yourself in a sort of if else loop. Um, anywho, exactly what I was saying not enough funding, outdated technology, aging workforce, lack of experience and skill, poor procurement, missing market knowledge, trade secrecy, missing data, missing infrastructure, um, over reliance on the private sector. I see some taking pictures, so I'll wait for a second here. Um, and then we get to the future of AI and government. So, this is a really cool paper that just came out in 2022 uh, that is arguing that you know bureaucracy is not being abolished or even diminished by modern advances in technology. On the contrary, technology appears to be bolstering bureaucracy's fundamental qualities. So 
governments are collecting large amounts of information. They are trying to use this to run the state more effectively and efficiently. This doesn't change. This has happened for a long time. It's still going to continue to happen. But what it means as we become more proficient at it is that we're seeing this transition towards like a statistical or a database state, right? Like you have your own ID, your own identifier, and you don't even necessarily have to interact with the person anymore. I was in Estonia eight years before this. Most of my interactions happen online. Uh, if I sign a contract, it's done digitally. When I registered the birth of my son, it was done digitally. When we applied for his benefits, it was done digitally. So there, this, this sort of like, um, you know, the, the, the bureaucrat that you're interacting on the street, this is disappearing, not in every country, but in some countries. And, and that's the direction that we would be heading in. Um, but as they become increasingly technical, as this sort of like desire to become more digital grows, especially in the context of COVID-19, when you see large amounts of resources being devoted to digitalization programs, even in the EU, I don't remember how many tens of billions have been devoted to this, or, or the UK is also saying they want to become, you know, a sort of new digital superpower and they want to use digital technology to fix the government somehow. Um, it's another point, which is technology doesn't fix broken systems, but anywho, um, that's basically inevitable. But what that means is the collection of data and everything else is only going to sort of accelerate because that's the only way that these systems work. But once again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a bad thing. It just depends on who you ask. But it's also important why we have democracy and we vote on these things and we develop strong regulations to make sure that it doesn't go into this sort of more, uh, I don't know, technocratic, authoritarian type direction. Uh, but similarly, most of these systems aren't built by the government, right? Like they're built by Amazon, Google, Facebook, IBM, Oracle. So there's going to be increasing interaction. I mean, there's already a lot, but when it comes to AI, a lot of this sort of power that the state would have had is being in a way delegated to the private sector. Of course, you can make maintain control of this using like procurement and stuff like that, but it's something that we should at least be thinking about. And it's not to say, okay, all tech is bad and we should just like hate big tech, but we should at least try to think about what the implications of this are. So I, I'm, I'm doing a sort of speed run through my um, talk. I think the, the discussion parts may be a bit more interesting. The way that I think about this, and I hinted a little bit about it earlier, I think one of the biggest opportunities for AI in the public sector is not really any of this stuff. This is pretty simple. And to be honest, a lot of these things you can also fix without AI. It's just data analytics or, or simply building a digital system. But where there will be a lot of power is in augmenting uh, human intelligence. And this on the right, I don't know, does anybody know what this is from? Some of my students will have sent me the video today. Anybody? No? Okay, cool. So this is Douglas Engelbart. He did the mother of all demos in 1968, uh, where they were demoing like real-time document collaboration, video conferencing. Um, what was that, 50 years ago now? Uh, craziest video you'll ever see. It's, it's, it's seriously mental. Um, but his whole idea was about augmenting human intelligence. So the idea was that we are facing problems that are increasing in complexity. They're coming faster and faster than before. Technology is creating more problems. And the only way that we as humans could basically be able to tackle these is through improving our ability to sort of like manage information, to use it to help us solve these problems. And so he actually is the one who like created the computer mouse, for example. Uh, and this all came out of his research lab at Stanford. So I think where we will see the most sort of benefit from AI is not any of the services, not this sort of thing, but it's things like ChatGPT that could be applied to sort of public servants who are then able to use it to augment their ability to complete tasks, uh, to be more effective, to be more efficient. And of course, you know, we are seeing public sector organizations deploy algorithmic and AI-based decisions, uh, decision-making systems. Yes, there are problems with this. Yes, we should talk about it. Um, no, we shouldn't just trust them. Um, that's a callback for earlier for those who were there. Um, <laughs> no, but I, th I think it's an important point to make. Like, um, this is happening whether we want it to or not. Like, there's no turning this train back, right? Like, AI is here, increased data collection is here. Uh, there is no stopping this. The train is left to station. The question is, like, how do we make sure that it goes in a way that we like? And I think another important point. Is um, this came from Gary Kasparov in 2010, writing a, a book review uh, that was talking about a AI and automation of chess. And he has this really cool quote in it that says, weak human plus machine plus better process was superior to a strong computer alone and more remarkably superior to a strong human plus machine plus inferior process. 
And so his whole point is, is it doesn't actually matter how great the technology is if you can't use it. Like what's really important is the process behind this, where you're able to augment the human, augment, you know, like allow me to, let's say, solve problems and things like this. Uh, and so the real focus is not necessarily on the tech, but also more so on like the processes, on the structures, on the regulations, so that we can use this in such a way that it actually does allow us to, for example, uh, live and, and be served by a, a better government, let's say. And because this has been coming up uh, before, I think I'd just say a few things on like the importance of procurement. Like this is going to become increasingly important. Nobody knows what AI is in the public sector. I mean, that's admittedly an overstatement, but like a lot of people don't know what AI is in the government. And these same people then have to go and procure AI systems. But guess what? When you write a procurement, you have to describe what you want, what data you have, how it works, and so on and so forth. So they don't have this capacity in house. They're going to become completely reliant on the private sector. And in some countries, that is literally their strategy. For example, Estonia, they said, no, we're not going to build our own in house AI capacity. We're basically going to rely on the private sector because it's cost savings and, and so on. Um, but we need to understand how to do that. So there needs to be really a strong focus on developing guidelines. Uh, to figure out how we can move away from just only buying from Amazon, because guess what? A lot of the AI know-how is locked up in startups and SMEs. But when you're a company of seven people, it doesn't matter, matter how cool your software is or how important it would be for the government. Uh, it's a lot of work to sort of, in, you know, do some of these and participate in some of these contracts. And furthermore, like how can you integrate these procurement processes into your organizational infrastructure and organizational practices? Uh, oftentimes, these things limit you. I mean. Let's, let's take the example of uh, agile software development. A lot of people like to talk about agile government. It's another term I, I hate, but that's not the topic of the day today. You try writing a government contract and then going to your lawyers and saying, I want to buy this system, but I don't know how much it's going to cost and I don't know when it's going to be done. Um, they're really not going to like that. So a lot of the ways that we build technology today aren't really compatible with how we have built technology in the past and how we think about procurement. So there really needs to be a monumental shift in sorts of mindset, in the organizational um, structures, and how we're thinking about these things. The tech part's probably the easiest part in all of this. The tech companies are going to build this no matter what. The really hard question is, how do we integrate it into the public sector? I personally think that the biggest sort of net gain will be on this intelligent augmentation rather than chatbots. Uh, but nobody's really talking about it so much, except for yesterday when Anderson Horowitz put out his thing on it, but that also went a little bit over. Um, so that's all I had. Uh, I have like half an hour for conversations. I put a QR code. This has, uh, it just links to a post that I did on intelligent documentation on LinkedIn. So if you want to learn more about that, there's lots of cool citations and videos and, and things like that. But with that, I would end my admittedly very quick overview um, and hope to have a bit more of a discussion with the people in the room. Because I think it's an important topic, and and I think it's it's yeah benefits more from from conversation. So thanks for having me. Questions? There's no way. Yeah. Continue. Um, okay, I have a question for you. Do you think that AI, as if you take away the part, basically, do you think AI as a policy object or as a political object? Uh, that governments have to deal with is in any way different from previous technologies? I think there are, there are some aspects related to AI that make it different than other technologies, especially when it comes to procurement. We've written a paper on it that sort of outlines this. Um, there are, it's something that I think needs to be fleshed out a little bit more. I don't think there's really a lot of agreement on it. There are certainly some who say actually AI is just like any technology. And so you can study it, for example, the, the, in the procurement um, domain, like you can just study it as any sort of innovative procurement method or or, or so on. Um, but, you know, if you're buying it, a, a new technology and you're going to use it for, let's say, decision making, uh, this represents a policy decision in a way. So like you have an algorithm essentially making policy decisions for you. Um, that sort of stuff is a little bit different than than other technologies. There are a few other reasons. Some I don't necessarily agree with, but in essence, I think it's a little bit different. We should probably think about it, and there's a lot more research to be done in that area. Yeah, Charlie. Uh, do you think government is kind of remotely ready to deal with the kind of amount of fraud that's going to be uh, no. coming through? I mean, I think the the weak link in a lot of these systems is is the person who picks up the phone in a call center or whatever it works for government, and you know suddenly they're faced with an AI generated, you know, reactive 
fraudulent call that's trying to socially engineer a you know phishing attack or whatever. Um, yeah, how how do we prepare for that? Yeah, I mean, I think this is an important point, right? Like um, we're about to see, and we already are seeing waves of uh, let's say disinformation campaigns of fraud. There's always cases of whatever. In, in Germany, they had a mayor who was tricked by a deep fake. You had uh, uh, Bill Browder who was convinced by a deep fake uh, that he was talking with the sort of ex or presidential candidate, let's say. Uh, this stuff is happening. Um, that's illegal as well. We already have regulations for these sorts of things. What's hard is one, enforcing it. Um, and, and two, it's really accessible to people now. So I myself, for example, it wouldn't take more than like a day to basically spin up a propaganda farm. Like it's not hard. Uh, from a technological standpoint, I think the government's really been caught off guard in this in this sense. Um, and this is why it's hard to talk about regulation, right? Because I think we do need regulation. But the idea that regulating, or let's say using AI or using any of these technology systems in government, right? People say we're going to do that, and then it's going to let us save money and then cut jobs. But the problem is you need people to actually do the inspections. Um, and if you have like three people in an AI algorithm and you're trying to regulate a massive nation state level um, fraud networks, it's pretty hard, uh, which is the other part of this, you know, people still matter. Um, and having people in the government who know what they're doing matters. It's just hard to convince people to join because they could go work for Amazon and make six times their salary. Yeah. I'll put a target on the back of being someone who's in government who kind of knows what he's doing a little bit. Um, so there's a few things that, so I'm uh, from the home office bit. Yeah, sure. Yes, I'm surprised at home office. Um, a couple of things that I think I would pick you up a bit on sort of around the procurement. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, there are challenges, but things are getting a, a lot, lot better on that front. Mm -hmm. Something we do keep running up against, though, are uh, perceptions and what we're doing rather than what we're actually doing. Mm -hmm. um, and also baselining human performance and comparing to machine performance and then comparing human machine to human performance and we very very quickly get in into a quagmire of uh, the human side of it and it's really not the people side so I mean people on autonomous vehicles for example a lot of focus on autonomous cars we haven't got a hope in hell of getting an autonomous train running and it's nothing to do with technology yeah it's to do with the people side of it the union side of it the, which are all valid uh valid concerns so there's there's things that government wants to do tries to do but can't do because of perceptions of what a the government should be doing whereas uh industry and products and a commercial approach is in some degrees freer to do things because it, it, it's Mark on for yeah. is that enabling or constraining them and what they do. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, it, it's a really good point, right? Because government and the private sector aren't the same. If uh, if Facebook or some other private sector company builds an algorithm to discriminate discriminates against twenty percent of their users, okay, it's probably not good, but maybe they're allowed to do that. If the government says, by the way, this percentage of our population can't use this service, um, good luck. Like, uh, you know, similarly, uh, when it comes to like innovation, how does the private sector? Uh, sort of keep its market dominance, it's creating constant innovation, it's trying to, to market capture, it's trying to get customers and so on. The only way it does that is by offering new products, by creating new solutions. The government has a population in a certain territory. Ideally, they're not trying to take other territories and other populations, uh, which means you have a pretty static user base, essentially. So some of the pressures that are driving this innovation in the private sector just don't exist for the public sector. And, and so what happens is then people look at whatever chat GPT and they're like, okay, how come our government can't do that? And it's like, well, we could use it, but it's also not really what we do. Um, especially when it comes to, I don't know, like innovative service design and private sector companies like to try out new user interfaces. And like, now it's, oh, we're being agile. We're creating all this new stuff. But if you're 75 years old and you just want your pension and every two weeks, the system uh, is changing. Uh, once again, it's, it's not very nice. So, but but full agreement that it's like it's you know the human side of this is often overlooked and it's not really a tech problem. Yeah, cool. Um, you had your hand up first. Thank you. Um, for the government's then learning to adopt the technology, how big a problem is it that um, AI, depending on your definition of it, compared to just technological advancements in the past? Um, I choose the definition of AI to be such that it's not just linguistic regression, but you have a black box where data goes in, 
magic comes out, it works. You can't really explain why the what's the you can't really explain the model you've developed, but you've got a model that works. Yeah, well, I think that's just a lie, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> the sorry for being very straightforward, but like um we we prepared uh, evidence for the uh, UK parliamentary inquiry into the regulation of AI. And this is one point that we like to drive home, which is that anybody who tells you they don't understand what they built is basically lying, right? Um, <laughs> I'm not saying we wouldn't understand what I built. I'm saying if you build a deep neural network, yeah. you can understand how everything works. My yeah. background is in mathematics. Um, but you can't say explicitly, oh, if this parameter increases yeah, sure. by one, this is how it's going to affect the model. Yeah. Whereas if you have a logistic regression, you can explicitly say, mm -hmm. this is what changes. Yeah. No, I mean, I think this is like where the regulation component comes into all of this in the sense that like oftentimes you hear this black box thing thrown out by people because they don't necessarily want to document how they built the thing. They don't want to talk about um, how the code was structured. We do have these requirements. Like if you build a building, for example, uh, there are well, licensing requirements. There are steps to do this. So like if the thing falls, you know what happened, probably where something went wrong. At the moment, the AI sort of field is basically like the Wild West where a lot of that stuff doesn't exist. Um, so I think it's just important that we have these conversations um, and also push back on a little bit. But, but I also understand that once you start getting, uh, I don't know, if you want to start talking about whatever RNMs or Q-learning and these sorts of things, like admittedly, it's not a linear regression, right? Like it is infinitely more complicated, um, but we should still have some understanding about what's going on. Definitely. Do you think there's going to be pushback from the government adopting these so new technologies I, as opposed to previous new technologies? I think that there's not going to be pushback from the government at the moment on it. That might change. There was a really great paper a couple of years ago by somebody in Goodwin, I don't remember, maybe 2018. And they they sent FOIA requests or Freedom of Information Act requests to, I don't know, 30, 40 different public sector organizations in the US and said, hey, how does this algorithmic system work? And then like three or four had any idea about how it worked. They had the documentation. So sometimes like they just want to do the thing, right? Like your government, I mean, many, a conversation that I've had quite often with public sector folks is that um, I have X amount of people with Y budget, and I need to do about 120% of my tasks. And now, in addition, uh, you want me to do innovate and adopt all these new digital technologies. And it creates a really weird sort of problem to have. Uh, AI might help with some of this, but they're not necessarily thinking, how does this work? You know, they're just thinking, does this let me do the thing? Okay. Um, so it, this gets back into how do you procure this stuff? How do you regulate it? Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Grant, you had your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to say two things. First is, um, I thought your opening statements there with particularly the meme um, <laughs> and the point about, um, you know, uh, logistic regression there, uh, you meant them, I think, as a joke, and I think they should be taken much more seriously. <laughs> no, that, I mean, that is how they, yeah. Um, yeah, there's this kind of a disconnect between that and your last slide. Um, but that was not the point I was going to make. The point I was going to make was to come off the earlier, supplement the earlier point that there are a whole group of people who cannot handle all of any of this. Um, there are people who can't use a computer or they can't use a smartphone or typically both, or they can't use them well enough to deal with, um, with these sort of systems very well. And I can put a number on that in Britain and the US because these studies have been done there about 15% of the British population is functionally illiterate. And that has a whole set of implications. It means they're probably not very well educated. It probably means they're isolated. It probably means they don't have access to any kind of technology. And so the problem here is, you know, you can require someone like universal credit does to, that require everyone to interact computationally, but that means a whole group of people are simply not going to get universal credit. So I, I will feed back off this uh, and say a few things. Um, one, I think that the biggest benefits of AI at the moment are still internal, like G to G sort of stuff. It, it's it's literally, I don't want to look at stacks and stacks of paper anymore uh, to find this one word, please have an algorithm do it. I, I don't think we're at the stage where we're going to see a lot of sort of like G to C stuff. It will come in the near future, but the biggest mm -hmm. benefits are still going to be internal in the public sector, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the second part of it is, I agree, I mean, we shouldn't just completely move online. Even in Estonia, they have a policy that every service is, for example, available on paper. Like that shouldn't go away. We need to take the digital divide seriously. The third part of this is that um, we actually can sort of get around this in the sense, if we're rethinking about public service delivery, this leaves the AI dimension a little bit. Um, but 
governments have to create or rather gather data to make AI systems work. I mean, that's how it's going to have to be. Um, but when you start to gather this data, right? Like, let's say you build a, a, I don't know, a property register or a population register. In this population register, you might have information about two people. Maybe they're single and now they're married. You can see they're married. There's no reason that you shouldn't be able to proactively say, hey, you're married, you're, you're, you're eligible for these benefits. So I've done a lot of work on proactive public services as well, which is trying to address this issue, right? Like the people who have the most to gain from digitalizing these things actually can be the ones who aren't online because they're not able to, uh, uh, let's say, use the computer or use the internet. They don't know where to look. They don't know, they're not able to take off time off work to go and talk with people. But if we already have the data, if we already know that something has happened, why can't we just send them a check in the mail? We shouldn't be using checks, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but, but there is a lot of movement in this direction. And, and one of the biggest benefits, I think, will be actually to address this and, and sort of, but then you get into questions of like, do governments actually want that or not? Do they want to be more effective? Well, and part of, part of the problem, just to extend your example a little bit further, is uh, a very large number of these people are unbanked. So not only can you not send yeah. them a check, check, you can't even transfer money to yeah. them. You can send them a check. Particularly uh, here in the UK, it's a problem as well. Yeah, helmet. Uh, I'd like to come back to this issue of public service delivery and yeah. know, to make it a little more concrete. I usually dislike the term the AI because it's about 29 different technologies for different purposes. What would be the areas in that data driven government perspective that you have shown where present available non emergent AI systems, non generative AI could actually help? The workforce that there coming to coming to grips with the relatively large demands of unbanked illiterate uh, people and then spend the time for those is, is that an option or is it is it the case that most of the countries that you've studied are not are under data they don't have the data they don't have registers that you can actually bring together they organize in yeah. silos their bureaucracies in paper driven has has given them non -co non coherent data, so whatever AI technology couldn't even find a correlation. Yeah, so I'm, I think there's a few parts to this, right? One, I agree that uh, there's this is a, a much longer conversation than a thirty minute talk. Um, to make this work, you need to have things like uh, Europe is doing pretty well at this because they have done a lot of work on, for example, the uh, ERA or, or you know the European Interoperability Framework and things like this. What do you need? You need base registers which have information about people. You need to know where these base registers are. You need to be able to to move this data between the base registers, which means you need to um, understand like have, have an interoperability platform essentially, and then you need to be able to take advantage of it. The biggest gains, I mean, we're talking about AI, all this other sort of stuff. I mean, many governments are still using Excel spreadsheets. Like we need to, to get to the point where we have the infrastructure, where we're able to interoperate in the EU. They're starting to push like cross-border service delivery, cross-border data exchange. So, so there's a lot of things that need to happen before this. Um, but I just think it's, it's important that we understand like when we start talking about AI, uh, it will require basically a lot of data collection um, because it's very, uh, admittedly, we already do a lot of data collection, but it could require sort of more. And I just want to drive that point home a little bit. Well, uh, Vicky, yeah. So maybe just to follow up on that, there are another question. So when we are thinking about the potential public good that can come from the use of these systems, combined with all the various sort of caveats you introduced in your talk, do we, should we be thinking of terms should, how much protection should we be building and should we be designing for, for, for bene benevolent states? Or should it be assuming all states are potentially, you know, corrupt or corruptible, or you know, well, all of them still hold, as you said, you know, they just a monopoly on the you know, use of violence, for example. So, yeah, how far do we, how far do we trust them? Yeah, I, I mean, this is the the. For example, we can take the case of Afghanistan, right? Like mm -hmm. we used biometric systems to provide benefits to people who were collaborating with the U.S. government. Turns out, U.S. government left. Now the Taliban's in charge. Guess what? We now know who all the collaborators are. Um, so sometimes you're building these systems, you don't necessarily think of the externalities. Uh, we should probably think about stuff like that. I think that the, you know, for example, AI, all these other sorts of things, they're going to be used in more authoritarian governments, and they're going to be used to sort of enforce their control. There's no avoiding that. They're going to they have the capacity in, in house to do that. This is why it's important that we and in, in the sort of West collectively also propose a different model and and try to push this. Um, but we also have to understand that this, at the end of the day, a lot of this is about control, but that doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing, which is the other thing that I want to stress that like control and surveillance sounds bad, doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, depends on, on who you ask, but 
I, I certainly we need to be at least thinking about it. And maybe to push it on a bit further. So, for example, you know, one of the big debates is whether or not you should effectively have some information silos in different branches of government. Um, is that the sort of thing that is actually quite a sort of a helpful safeguard even for a GCD advocacy in these overall? No, solutions? I think it makes no sense, makes to be sense. honest. Okay. And I, I like to, to me, it, 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 it they, they will just get exactly. I mean, if you're not supposed to have the data, you'll just find a way to keep it because you don't want to ask the other organization board all the time. And, and then what you end up with is 18 copies of the same database that are all at different version. Uh, and then it leaks and then you don't know who leaked it. And then you can always point the finger at the other one. Whereas if you have like a single digital system with proper sort of safeguards in place, you go through the, the cybersecurity auditing, you have all these things built up. You generally know where it is, what's supposed to be there. Um, and this is when you start getting into discussions around like, how do you best build technical systems? Things like the once only principle are really cool in the sense that if the government already has this data on me, why do I need to keep giving it 17 times, which is the other side effect if you have data siloed everywhere. Um, so it just comes back to like, how do we build these digital systems better? Um, which is transforming essentially every day as technology develops. Um, yeah, I'll be. So you mentioned that ideally you would want to see public institutions try to develop their own digital capabilities and their own AI capabilities. Uh, but then you also mentioned in your Sony example that a lot of that was outsourced to private institutions, uh, which is unideal. So to get to the point, again, just in your opinion, drawing some of your own experiences, what would really need to change to allow a lot of public institutions, a lot of governments to actually adopt their own digital systems without being reliant on the end third party, on third private parties parties? Yeah. So I think like as much as I like to rip on the private sector, I don't think they're a bad thing, right? Like I think public-private partnerships are good and they're they're certainly a, a, a place for them, and that's not going to go away. Whether or not and how much you use them depends on your sort of system of governance, what you think, I mean, the UK is still very much, we're going to procure every, once again, a little bit of an overstatement, but, but, but still sort of stuck in this new public management type mindset um, compared to, to other states, which are much more, um, I don't know, Fabarian in that sense and trying to develop stuff in house. Or like it, I talked with, um, for example, one of my uh, colleagues that I met here, he's the, uh, the CTO of Mexico City, and he made a deliberate choice to not uh, purchase infrastructure or like put things in the cloud or to sort of outsource things because funding often is coming in from like external or uh, aid donations and things like that. So they wanted the stuff to buy it and put it in their office so they knew it would be there. And if the funding ran out, they weren't necessarily stuck with not being able to operate the systems. So it's really contextually dependent. It really depends on the country itself. Um, and I think this is like the other message in all of this, which is this digitalization stuff, it's really influenced by the context. Like what works in Germany, what works in the UK, it won't necessarily work in, um, I don't know, South Korea or, or, or Singapore and, and vice versa, or in India, when I tried to talk with them about capacity problems, my friends who are working in digital government there, they say, no, we, that's not a thing here. We have the people who build this stuff. Um, yeah, so it, 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 it's, it's highly dependent. Uh, Pratham, you've had your hand up a few times. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm wondering if you will either talk me further into a hole that I'm in or talk me out of it. Um, which is that I think that like, and you hinted at this a little bit, like we've been collecting, like states have been collecting information for hundreds of years and using them to make decisions. And something that concerns me is that often when we talk about AI regulation, especially in the public sector, and I think like early versions of the EU AI Act really screwed up on this. What they're asking is like, what evidence do we use to make decisions? Like not a machine is making this decision, but like a bureaucrat with a flow chart is also making decisions that might be governed by some of this legislation. And so rather than like, be answering the question of like we should be regulating AI. They seem to be asking like what is our political theory of decision making. Do you like do you think that that is a problem? Do you, like is this a thing that I'm just making up in my head, um, or is this like an actual concern? And are we going to be able to actually build these systems without having some sort of new political consensus on decision making yeah. and fairness? No, I think it's certainly something that happens. Um, and once again, this this does come back a little bit to what how you think about the world. And how much you like the idea that the state is collecting a lot of information about you and making decisions, and whether or not they have your best interest at heart is is a sort of political question. But it's like, yeah, I, I don't really have a good answer for that. It's only that that I agree that you certainly see a lot of um, discussion in in this area. Personally, I, I think that um, some people take it a little bit too far. Yeah. Cool. Other, you had your hand up as well. Uh, it was just uh, picking up on the point of the government private sector and perhaps framing it more of a, as a symbiotic relationship. Yeah. So others have raised points around the, are we ready for the scale issue? 
of, of uh, fraud, for example. Yep. Now, that's going to be predominantly on um, private sector platforms. It's not going to be government platforms that are, that are driving that fraud, but government provides the framework for those private sector companies to work in. So it is it is both. We, we need private sector to help us, and private sector yep. needs us to create an environment in which they can run their businesses. So it's not just us buying stuff from them. Yeah, of course. I mean, and similarly, like when it comes to things like digital identity, you you absolutely see it as a, a success factor sort of across the board that you need to have private sector involvement, like banks or telecoms or services that people interact with on a common basis, because realistically, people in the government come to you like two, three times. And if you're requiring them to use a digital identity system to log in like twice a year, they're probably not going to bother with it. But if they have to use it to interact with their bank or with their to pay their phone bill or to do anything else, you start to build up these positive feedback loops over time. Um, so, so certainly this ecosystem approach is, is a key part of all of this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you are aware of um, federated machine learning being used by governments or if that's a hot topic in terms of data privacy issues and having multiple data sets basically train the same model, but have it not be shared. Um, they came from a government perspective, but also partnerships, whether it's private companies or you can have government and private sectors working together to train a model. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's a ton of research in this, and it's obviously like an in-demand area, particularly when we start thinking about how do we do AI on like, um, how do we do it? Like, basically, how do we do statistics on, um, let's say, confidential data sets? So there's an Estonian company, sorry if I was going back to it, I just know it very well, um, called Cybernetica, and they built this product called ShareMind, and it basically allows you to do complex uh, statistical calculations on data that's essentially encrypted and you can't see the base data. It's pretty interesting stuff. There's a lot of development going on this in this space. It's probably only going to become increasingly um, common, particularly in Europe, when, when a lot of the regulations are coming into effect, like the AI Act, already we have GDPR. Um, countries, uh, not to the EU, probably aren't going to push for it so hard, uh, but we'll see. Cool. Any other questions? I have time for one or two more. Yeah. So, a question about open source software. Yeah. <laughs> sure. It's really yeah. 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 To you as well about procurement. Um, you know, a lot of AI and machine learning developments enabled through open source software. Yeah. Um, from your experience or from home office or anyone else here, uh, how do procurement regulations kind of hinder or maybe enable use of open source software? Makes it hard, usually. It's the short answer. Um, but I think this is also another important point to this, which is that. Like one cool thing, well, one, I think open source is probably a little bit overhyped as well. Um, like, I don't think open source is going to fix the world. Um, but that, that's a whole other uh, can of worms. <laughs> um, certainly, it's, it's hard to procure open source things. Governments like to know that it's uh, for them. They like to have to sort of like IP stuff. Um, that's changing. I mean, there's, of course, like new open source initiatives. Uh, governments are starting to use open source software. There probably are some benefits for it. Um, when it comes to like AI and machine learning, this is really driven by open source development. I mean, a lot of the most popular sort of algorithms and things today still are using open source code or have been open source. So uh, being able to access talent of people who are working on this, I think we will start to see in the AI space a lot more usage in this area, but we'll see. Thomas has his hand up. So I'd like to argue if in this public-private partnership symbiosis also in the, in the strategic way. Uh, it's not open source alone or closed source alone, but it's really if all parties involved have believable alternatives to do things a different way. There needs to be a believable alternative for those people that are illiterate because they need the public services. You can't really just 100% yeah. solution on one. And I think it's very important to understand that that kind of balance of power actually works if you have believable alternatives. The German government successfully educated the monopolist um, because they basically took out all their open source their capabilities and now realize, wait a second, there's a monopolist. We have successfully created a monopolist. Now this actor acts like a monopolist, raises prices, strange conditions, and we have no place to go. So it's really the interesting notion how and on what level European nation state, commune, or other level, do you want to have believable alternatives to go somewhere else to take the same things? And I think that is the would be the important part in that uh, relationship that you, at least in Europe, have other suppliers at hand that you could go to. It doesn't have to have 50%, 50%, and 8% of market share is enough no. to run some innovation and to bite into um, in near monopolist fight. 
I mean, I, I think some things that I have seen is like requiring the use of, let's say, open standards, um, open source software, open source models, and then you just like procure a solution to the problem. But you say like you should be able to provide the solution, but you should use open source or CC0 or whatever else. So this is something that I have seen. Um, and then I've also seen governments like release stuff open source uh, because that open source is probably going to become increasingly important uh, when we think about it. it's sort of a geopolitical thing, right? Like you want people to be using your code. I mean, Microsoft bought GitHub that wasn't like out of the goodness of their heart. <laughs> you know, there's a reason for this. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, GitHub Copilot is really cool and it's a human intelligence augmentation thing and it makes you really efficient at coding. Uh, because I don't have to write the boilerplates anymore, the templates and things like this. Like it, it really can speed you up. Um, so, so more and more of this stuff is going to feed into AI. It's going to become increasingly popular. Um, but yeah, I think that's all the time we have today. So, thanks for for being here and listening. I hope it was interesting. Um, I'm really accessible via email. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions, comments. Uh, yeah, thanks again.